Okay, welcome everyone to lecture number, oh geez, 16? I think it's 16. Uh, anywho, we're talking about databases uh, today. Today and to on Thursday are going to be our two discussions on databases. Uh, unlike front-end and back-end, these will be a little bit uh, heavier on the more not coding side and more on the kind of like conceptual side thinking about things. And I think that's just kind of because of the nature of databases themselves, there's maybe a little bit less code that we can implement ourselves rather than just interacting with them. Um, and I'm sure you all had a wonderful time interacting with databases in your recent homework. Uh, yeah, without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. So our objectives for today is to introduce you to databases and to talk a little bit about the kind of in-depth of relational databases. And eventually we'll talk about document databases and graph databases. So at this point, we've covered front end. And front end constitutes what the website says, how it looks, and what it does. Yeah, this, this homework was a tough one. Um, it wasn't supposed to be tough but we messed up the error piping a little bit in our auto grader and so it made it really hard to troubleshoot uh, our bad our bad the next one the database one we are ensuring will not be that way so yeah uh, so we talked about front end we additionally talked about back end which is how we get the website and the other files to the user and then also how we interact with sensitive information like stuff that we're storing on databases and so what's next? Well, you know, how do we store large amounts of data? How do we make sure that our data remains when our computers crash? So obviously, if we're running our server and, um, you know, maybe we're storing a ton of user, important user information just in memory and that uh, computer loses power and our server goes down, not only is our server now down, but we've lost all of that information since it was all stored in RAM, which is volatile and, and gets deleted on power off. And then how do we ensure that the data is always accurate? And this is kind of especially poignant when you have multiple servers, right? If we think that Google only has one server interacting with their database, well, you know, that's just not really feasible. They have uh, probably thousands, if not tens or hundreds of thousands of servers storing or, or serving people all around the world, all kind of editing um, single sources of truth, you know, their databases, uh, and they need to make sure that that's always accurate. If two things try to write to the same location, you know, what's going to happen? Well, we'll explore some of that later. So obviously the answer to these, hence the lecture title and hence the, the topic of discussion today is going to be databases. And as the name may suggest, databases are what we use to aggregate large amounts of data. In our discussion over the next two lectures, I should say, we'll focus on the topics of databases, including queries, updating, designing, and scaling databases. So how do we query databases? How do we update uh, things in our database? How do we design our databases so that they are efficient, effective, easy to use, uh, all of these things? And then how do we scale our databases so that they can work with maybe many, many servers trying to access them all at once? Additionally, we're going to see how these properties change and these topics change depending on the type of database that we're using. And so we introduced that we were going to be discussing relational databases today. Additionally, there's document or NoSQL or object-oriented databases. All of those things are the same. Uh, and then finally, there's graphical databases, which I just think is super cool. Um, maybe probably less actively used in industry. Uh, but certainly an interesting topic, and I think uh, definitely, definitely valuable for your time as honor students to at least be introduced to. I mean, they're fun, if nothing else. Hopefully you will feel the same way. So um, we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. So, or rather, we'll talk about some of these topics, uh, my mistake. So first we'll talk about queries, which is, you know, how do we read from our databases? How does our process for reading from these databases change based on what type of database we're using? Primarily speaking, this is going to be learning about the language that we're going to be interacting with these databases in. And so if you've ever heard of SQL, that's an example of one. Um, but, you know, each one can have its own. Um, as well as updating our databases, we'll talk about kind of this idea of transactions and we'll talk about the properties of ACID. And we'll actually talk about that today, ACID being an acronym. 
Uh, we'll also talk about designing our databases. And so how can we design our databases to be efficient, to be scalable, to be easy to work with? And for this, we'll talk about these two things, the ER model and the normal form. And we'll talk about those on Thursday. And then finally with scaling, how can we adjust our databases so they're faster? And how can we adjust our operations so that they are faster? And we'll do our best just to kind of interleave this scaling conversation with kind of the, the conversation on the types of databases that we're going to be using in general. So let's start uh, with our discussion of relational databases here. And when we think of relational databases, the first thing that I want you to think of is a spreadsheet right? A Google sheet or an Excel page, something like that. And that's really the idea that you should have in your mind because these relational databases are stored of in, are stored in tables. And these tables are made up of rows and columns, you know, as, as we know. For our use cases and for, you know, most use cases, uh, the column represents a feature, some information about each row and each row represents a data point. Generally speaking, the first row, uh, this should say column, my mistake. Let me fix that. That's kind of an important difference. Apologies. The first column is the primary key. And this does need to be unique to each row. Oh, well, okay. On the next slide, it's still wrong. But remember that this says uh, column, please. I'll, I'll fix this after lecture. And then additionally, we can have other columns which work as foreign keys that connect one table to a different table. And we'll look at graphical examples of this in a second. Don't worry. And go in depth about it. So, um, But let's talk just briefly about the relational database properties. Um, there's really no significance, or rather there shouldn't be significance to the order of the rows, and there shouldn't be significance to the order of the columns, except for that uh, key, the, the primary uh, key, of course. Each row should have exactly one value for each column, so no storing tuples. Each column should be one and only one data type. And so let's look at kind of a visual example. So first we have two tables here. We have an employees table and a sales table. We have different columns in these tables. We have different rows in these tables. Uh, we have primary key for the employees table, which is also, in fact, a foreign key for the sales table. So we'll kind of explore these one by one with my new fancy arrows, which you all have to tell me if you like or not. So first we have, you know, the tables themselves being kind of employees and sales. These are just what we call these tables when we want to interact with them. Then we have rows, uh, you know, obviously this one's maybe not incredibly surprising. The rows are the rows of each one. Uh, this top one is just a row of the labels, so we don't really include that. Uh, the columns are in fact the columns, so uh, they're columns. I'm, I'm really not sure, uh, you know, what else to say about them. They, uh, they are in fact columns, and so they make up the columns of the data. Note how each one does represent a different kind of attribute of it, and each one only holds one data type, right? We talked about those. Um, there's the primary key. Uh, the primary key needs to be unique to each row, and it's what we're going to use to index. Note how in these two different... Yeah, nice. Yeah, <laughs> everything matches the, the colors. Um, notice how they uh, can be unique to each table, right? And so something in sales has a totally different primary key to then to something in employees. And then finally, the foreign key, which is this employees column, which uh, kind of matches the, the salesperson ID down here, right? And so here we can see that uh, Thea, you know, sold a 422 and one cent dollar item to customer ID one because it's linked through this salesperson ID. Wonderful. So uh, just we'll, we'll talk briefly about how you would actually... Is this plugged in? It, it beeped at me like it was dying. Uh, if my headset dies, then uh, uh, say something in chat, please. But hopefully it shouldn't. It's plugged in. Okay, so how would we actually use kind of a MySQL database? Well, you know, the first step, of course, is to install MySQL. Um, you actually will then set up the server. You'll create authentication, a login for it. You'll connect to that MySQL server because that's what it is, is it's a separate server through your favorite Python or, you know, whatever language. Oh, yeah, you all can hear that too. I'm surprised actually a little bit by that. 
uh, you'll connect through the favorite Python or whatever package, um, you know, whatever language you're using, and then you'll run SQL commands. Well, uh, you know, what what is SQL commands is kind of the next question, I would imagine. Well, SQL stands for uh, Structured Query Language. It is a language, um, though it is maybe not a programming language. More modern ones are, but I think some of the older classic SQL flavors uh, are not Turing complete. And so uh, they are more so, I guess, I, they're a query language is what they are. Um, SQL is the language that we're going to use to query, edit, and basically otherwise interact with our, uh, our databases. Um, usually, uh, this is going to be relational for object-oriented databases. You generally are not going to be writing SQL or something that looks like SQL. Um, usually, though, for graphical databases, you write something that looks a little bit like SQL, but definitely is not SQL. So for now, we're going to be discussing some basic classic SQL commands. The reason why I say, you know, kind of classic SQL is because SQL, there's a lot of different, we, you can call it flavors of SQL, meaning, you know, things that are uh, a little bit different, you know, they rewrite it so that it is a little bit higher level or has a little bit different functionality or a little bit added functionality. And so we'll just be talking about the basic classic SQL, which is kind of the, the original. It is by no means the most popular, though. I think uh, Oracle Oracle's SQL is the most popular right now. In any case, uh, we'll talk about a few of these. So generally speaking, when we talk about these commands, there's going to be in all caps here, and uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about their purposes here, and then we'll kind of dive into them one at a time and go more in depth. So first, we have select. Select extracts data from a database. And it kind of fits under this umbrella of querying our database, if we remember those four categories. Next, we have update, delete, and insert into. As the names may suggest, update would update data in a database. Data being, of course, you know, rows or a row or multiple rows. Delete, same thing. Insert into obviously inserts a new row. And, you know, we can put these under the umbrella of updating our database. Additionally, we have create database, create table, and drop table. Um, you know, these are a little bit weird. I'm going to put these under the category of designing a database, but really it's maybe more so the category of updating a database because it's creating a database. Uh, ideally, you know, you're not... These, these are kind of the tools that you use to implement your design rather than uh, tools that you use to design, if that makes sense. And then finally, we have index, uh, create index and drop index. And these are going to work for kind of scaling our database uh, and making it run faster, making it uh, work better, be more scalable. So let's start to talk about these one at a time. First, we'll talk about select. And we'll use our same kind of graph here to reference. Select is, as the name may suggest, used to select a column from the table. Often it's used with this other keyword that we didn't mention called where. Um, we're going to be using where in a, a large portion of these, so I kind of just figured I'd include it. And so the way we use this is we can say select all, star being all. You know, we learned about this in Bash. From employees, employees being the table. And so what that would do is it would go to this employees table, and it will return you all of the rows and all of the columns. Additionally, we can do things like select order total from sales. And in this situation, we would get uh, one column of order totals, right? So 422.01, 899.76, et cetera, et cetera. I always say et cetera, but it, it's really et cetera. And we can even kind of have more advanced filters here and say select customer ID from sales where order total is greater than 500. So we're saying, you know, I would like to know essentially what customers have purchased things more than $500 worth. Of course, we can kind of get arbitrarily fancy with these uh, with the help of additional ones as well, but we're not going to be going kind of too into the fancier stuff you can do. And so if you are interested in, you know, knowing all of the crazy things that you can do with SQL queries, I'm, I mean, that's a, you know, kind of a large topic that you can learn about and study in, uh, and Google is your best friend there. And so that's really what I suggest. But, you know, we'll kind of move on with our discussion for now. So next we have update. Uh, update is, as the name suggests, used to update rows in the table. And once again, it's often used with where in order to filter edits. And so we can say, I would like to update employees, and I'd like to set 
last name equal to Eustace, where employee ID equals to. So maybe I get a legal name change and my company needs to change it. You know, some uh, database engineer may run this command uh, in order to actually change that. And so we use update to say, this is the table that I would like to edit. We use set to describe what we're actually changing. In this case, last name equal to Eustace. And then we're gonna use where to filter out where we actually wanna do that. Now, if we did update sales, set last name equal to Eustace, this would error out. And this is how you do a comment in SQL, just by the way. But, you know, uh, why do we think this would error out? Give everyone a moment. This isn't a quiz question, so there's no need to pull bot, but you know, responses are nice if you want to type in chat. Exactly, sales doesn't have that last name category, and so that'll error out. Uh, in fact, you know, if we even tried to filter, uh, you know, in this situation up here, if we tried to do set last name equals Eustace, where order total, you, you know, is greater than 500, that's going to error out because that doesn't exist. Uh, and then, you know, it won't error out, but it won't change anything if our filter just kind of limits everything. But it will, in fact, error out if that happens, which is maybe a good thing for us, right? If it tried to do something, then it would be uh, probably not so fun. Uh, yeah, uh, so Sean asks, uh, it's been some time since I worked with SQL. When we edit slash delete data or tables, are changes applied immediately, or is there a way to run some changes without applying the changes until later? So the way I'll respond to that is in kind of classic SQL, like your basic SQL, uh, no. It, it, any change that you run is, is uh, kind of changed immediately. But there's many uh, development tools similar in a way to IDEs that will allow you to explore how a uh, certain SQL transaction will affect your table before you actually execute it on the main uh, your your production database is what you call it. And, you know, the issue of messing up your production database because you ran some SQL thing that accidentally changed too much is a, uh, I'll say, very common problem. So, and to kind of explain the situation, uh, we'll look at delete. And so delete is used to delete rows from a table. And once again, you should probably use where if you're using delete. And so we can say, you know, if we just ran delete from employees, uh, well, this will delete employees, right? Even though it may not seem this is, you know, it may not seem like this is doing anything because we don't have that where, uh, this actually would delete everything in employees. Hey, Afnan, what's up? I'm happy that you're free from Calc. Now come to another lecture. Um, so yeah, uh, be a little bit careful with running some of these commands, right? In this situation, you would get something like, uh, X rows affected and you'd have a small heart attack as you notice that you just deleted everything in your employees table and, uh, it would basically be impossible to get back at that point. Now, you know, there are definitely ways to do it, but, uh, not in kind of classic SQL and nonetheless, it will cause you a great amount of pain. So, you know, make sure to filter your deletes with where is basically the moral of the story here. And, you know, always read a SQL query twice before you enter it on a production server. The next thing we'll talk about is insert into. As the name may suggest, you use this to insert rows into a table. Insert into is often used with where, once again, or rather, no, it's not. My apologies. I need to proofread better. I was, I was writing these uh, very early in the morning. So uh, for insert into, you define the table that you'd like to adjust and you kind of have two options here. One, you can just input all of the correct columns in order. And so we'll say insert into employees, four being my employee ID, William, first name, Eustace, last name, department engineering. Or Ah, ha, ha. So uh, you all might have heard a, a beep, which I actually think was the beep from 10 minutes ago as well. That's what I'm using to stop my headset from dying or from turning off automatically. So it does sound like my headset dying no noise, though. It's actually not the headset dying noise. That's a, a sound file that I have playing uh, that beeps every 10 minutes just so that they don't turn off automatically. Anywho, uh, insert into sales, then you can actually define, you know, customer ID, salesperson ID being the things that we want to change and we'll import the, 
input those here. Uh, but my question to you all is, is what will order total contain here if we run this? It will actually affect a row. This won't error out. But what will what will order total contain? Any guesses? It's not a trick question. Zero, close. But zero is, you know, uh, maybe an actual value. And so that's a little bit dangerous to set it to zero, right? If that was something like a class, yeah, exactly, Nathan. So it'll contain null, right? And, and the reason for that is we really kind of do need a way to distinguish zero and null. Uh, my example to you would be, what if this was the customer ID column and uh, one of the customers was actually zero? Right. In that case, we're assigning customer zero to have certain orders that aren't actually theirs. And so that could be uh, maybe bad. Right. Maybe not so good. And so, yeah, anything that you don't fill out here will have null. And, uh, you know, having too many nulls in your data set can sometimes make your life hard. So maybe try to avoid that. Next, we'll talk about create database. As the name may suggest, this is used to create a database. You run create database, whatever you want to call the database. Um, you know, nothing, nothing kind of crazy there. Uh, do note that the database is kind of the higher level than tables. Um, you know, databases are, are the entire thing. It's your entire server. And so it, uh, once you kind of create a database, there's actually not very much that you interact with it. You enter the database and then you are kind of just living in that. Does skipping the primary key also null it? Yes. Um, so one note about primary keys is that the primary key doesn't actually have to be only one column. If the first column is not unique, then it will use multiple columns uh, to become unique, essentially. And so if the first column is null, it'll start to just use multiple columns. And there's a couple reasons why you generally want to avoid that behavior. The easiest of which to understand is that multiple columns is generally slower than one column when it comes to indexing and whatnot. So, uh, yeah, sometimes you have to, though. So, you know. So uh, the next thing is create table. This is used to create a table. And this is one thing that we're going to spend a little bit of time on because this is kind of where we start to talk about major decisions, which is, uh, you know, what are you going to have for these tables inside of these tables? And so when you want to run create table, you run create table, whatever you want to call the table. In this case, we'll call it employees. And you start to define each of the columns and their data types. So this is maybe one of the things that we have to start to decide, especially with things like strings, is we actually have to determine how many characters we want in each string. And so you have to give it a max amount for, for any string. And so in this case, you know, I chose 50, um, you know, for first name and last name, I think 50 is a safe choice, right? There's definitely people who can have uh, very long first and last names, as well as the fact that, um, you know, we, we just want to make sure things don't break for them. As for department, you know, I probably could have made it smaller. Uh, you know, whatever company this is for, we probably know the longest name of our longest department. But nonetheless, it's probably better to have wiggle room there than to uh, have a mistake, right? And so one thing that you have to think about when you're creating these is, you know, how are these things going to connect to, to different things? And so for um, employee ID, well, maybe that's not a great example. If there was a different foreign key, maybe first name or last name, or maybe first name and last name that links to a different page, uh, you know, these data types should really be the same across those pages because the foreign keys kind of have to be the same. And if they weren't, you know, you might run into a situation where one is not aligned with the other and you can have some major mistakes. So keep these things in mind, uh, maybe when you're building tables or thinking about building databases. So the next thing we'll talk about is dropping a table. Dropping a table is used to delete tables. It's pretty simple. You just say drop table, and then the name of the table you want to delete. So the next thing that we'll talk about is uh, indexes and creating indexes. And so indexes uh, are going to be used to speed up our databases and to allow for our queries to be a lot faster. And they use one or more not necessarily unique columns to create indexes. And when I say not necessarily unique, what I mean is that you can have two things that are the same in maybe the ID column or name column that you're using to index off of, and it's not a problem. So let's look at what happens with our normal query. And so we'll say select all from friends where name is equal to Zach. 
And so what we do is we check each row. We say, nope, this one is not equal to Zach. Is Dave equal to Zach? No. Andrew? No. You get the rest. Eventually we get to eight. And we'll say, is, is Zach equal to Zach? Yes. And we'll return that row. Of course, how many comparisons do we have to make in order to do this? Uh, n, right? However many we have in our data set. If Zach is the last element in a, you know, one million person data set, we have to check one million things before we're going to get to Zach. Uh, that could be slow. And so uh, let's see if there's a way to speed it up some. Well, we can use this create index and we can say create index, whatever we want to call our index on friends being the table. And then we'll say name name being the column that we want. And then we'll run this select all from friends where name equals Zach again. And so what happens here? Well, we basically, you know, we take this name column and we're going to give it indexes here. And these indexes align with the IDs. And so what's going to happen here is this name column is now sorted, right? We've indexed it, we've sorted it, and so we can now, you know, perform kind of a binary search. And so we can skip to halfway down the list, and we can say, okay, is Matt uh, greater than or less than Zach? Meaning, you know, is Matt going to come before or after Zach? Well, Matt's going to come before Zach. And so we know Matt is not equal to Zach, and we also know everything before Matt is not equal to Zach. Uh, is Todd equal to Zach? No. And everything before it also is not equal to Zach. And then finally, is Zach equal to Zach? Yes, of course it is. And so when eventually we get to Zach, we'll get that the index is equal to 8. That will map to the 8th ID here, which of course is our primary key. And uh, immediately we have the row. And so instead of doing n operations, we can do log n operations, which, you know, can be significantly faster. In our case, this was 2.6 times faster. If you have a million items, it's 50,000 times faster. And if you have a billion items, it's 33 million times faster. So obviously we uh, very rapidly see a, a very large improvement in kind of the efficiency of, of using indexes and using them correctly. And so, you know, once again, if you have some query that you're running often, right, uh, essentially a from that you're running very often, and you know that you are, then maybe you want to index that, right, so that we can get better performance. I think for our case, uh, in our most recent homework, we had the, you know, get single user. Uh, maybe that happens very often, because maybe every time your user loads a page, the back end needs to request their profile picture URL or some information about that person to display it, you know, in the top right, like for Google, right? We have me in the top right here, as, as well as here, right? Um, we have to get a database request to do that. And so if we can index off of whatever we're searching, uh, whatever our query is, then that's going to allow this query to be, you know, uh, hundreds, tens of thousands, or millions times faster. And if you're a service like Google, where you know you're doing uh, very, very many of these queries every second, it really will have a very, very significant impact. My headphones should beep soon. Um, next thing is just drop index. As we may be able to imagine, drop table deletes a table, drop index deletes an index. And so if we create index IDX name on friends name, then we can drop index IDX name on friends. So I'll do a quick quiz. Uh, which of these is not a SQL command? Uh, the poll bot is going to be up in a second. I just have to remember the commands to run. Okay, it should be up. So go ahead and react to Pollbot. You all a couple minutes. There's the beep. So which of these is not a SQL command? If you don't remember, of course, Google is your friend. I wouldn't, well, if you write a lot of SQL, I would probably expect you to memorize it, but, you know. I had to write a good bit of SQL at an internship I did once. Uh, I was an ed tech company. It was, uh, it was interesting.
I didn't really enjoy it. But it was fun to learn something new like that. Very different than what I had learned before. So it was, it was very nice. But uh, a little clunky. You can tell that SQL's like kind of old when you use it. Just the way it feels. Don't know how else to explain it. There's so many things that make it, I think, a lot easier nowadays, though. You can basically write SQL in Python and it eventually works. And then, you know, people who develop that try to make it all Pythonic, and so SQL becomes very easy to use. And then, of course, as we'll talk eventually, there's object oriented databases, or which just change it to be uh, more like an API, I guess. Okay, I'll give everyone just a little bit more here, uh, just a couple more seconds. So get your answers in if you haven't already. Again, this is the attendance for lecture. And this is the only quiz uh, for this lecture. So uh, if you have not responded to the quiz, do it so that you can get lecture attendance. Okay, I am closing the poll in five, four, Three, two, one. Closed. Great. So most people put number two, which is correct. Find is not one. Uh, count is one. We didn't talk about it, but it is actually uh, uh, one of them. And it's actually a very useful one, too. It allows you to, as the name may suggest, count. Uh, how many things are in the response. So, you know, if, if maybe if I wanted to see, we'll go back to this example here. If I wanted to see how many people have purchased something greater than 500, I can throw a count in here and, uh, you know, it'll, it'll work. It'll return instead of, you know, all of the data, it'll just give me a number saying, you know, 200 or whatever. Oop, too far. Wonderful. So find is not a SQL command. Uh, I guess it would be select is the closest thing. Maybe where. Okay, so let's take uh, a small step back. And for the rest of the lecture, we're going to talk a little bit more generally about how a good database works. And I'll say the word good here maybe more tentatively because the stuff we're going to be talking about is um, sometimes optional, actually, and interestingly. So at the heart of any interaction with the database is something that we're going to call a transaction. And so a transaction is a series of operations that executes a larger update. And so in our class, in our case, uh, you know, we'll say update employees set last name equal to Eustace, where employee ID is equal to two. Well, you know, my question I have for you is if you have multiple things interacting with this database, what happens if my employee ID changes uh, during it? What if, you know, instead of employee ID equals two, I become employee ID equals three halfway through this? Well, you know, suddenly it's, it's kind of messed up, right? Or what happens if um, I just get deleted outright? And so you've you've matched all of the places, and then all of the rows where I exist are then removed, and you're trying to set the last name for rows that don't exist. Are you going to recreate the row and set everything to null except for that? Uh, you know, neither of those are not necessarily good behavior. And, you know, one thing that we want to also keep in mind is that these things need to happen kind of in their entirety or not. And we'll talk about that in a lot more detail in just a second here. But the way I want you all to understand it is a transaction is something that we look at and say, okay, this is all, you know, one event, right? That's how we can kind of understand it. When you're, you know, paying money for goods and services, it's not like you're going to pay half the money and receive half the product or pay half the money and receive nothing because the transaction somehow failed. Either it happens or it doesn't, right? So transactions and generally the databases that use transactions have the following four properties. Atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. And we call these the ACID properties. Interestingly, uh, not all modern databases uphold all of these ACID properties. They're these things that we're going to be talking about that are kind of these... Uh, I'll say core tenants of being a good database, but um, many modern databases choose to relax these properties a little bit in order to gain 
uh, usually significant performance benefits. I believe um, MongoDB, which is a, a database one, relaxes the consistency uh, constraints some. I think that's the only one. Uh, another example of something that relaxes the consistency constraint, uh, if we can call it a database, is actually uh, blockchain. So Bitcoin itself uh, acts a little bit like a database that has no consistency, but uh, very high. Um, uh, let's see if I can remember the terms. There's a trade-off where you can have basically two of three. Uh, one of them is consistency. One of them is uh, basically like parallelism in a way. I can't remember the third right now. In any case, let's talk about each of these. First, atomicity. Um, so transactions are made up of many operations, and we want to ensure that these operations happen completely or not at all. And so if any statement in your transaction fails either partially or completely, uh, the entire transaction has to fail completely, and the database should end in the same state that it began in. So an example, after setting half of the total matching rows, our database server turns off. Well, uh, you know, what, what has happened? You know, suddenly half of the rows are there and half of the rows aren't. Our database is in this weird broken state where it's not correct. Uh, you know, we don't really know what the state is and so things, things aren't good, right? So implementing different features to ensure atomicity uh, is going to make sure that we don't leave our database in a broken state. And so, you know, uh, this is maybe uh, something new, but let's just sit here and brainstorm for a second on how we may be able to ensure that this uh, would happen. What what features might you implement to ensure this? I'll say there's basically two major answers. Uh, one of them is very hard to come by, and the other one is maybe a lot easier to come by. And so we'll see if we can uh, get there. One core idea that I want you to think about is that if we want to ensure that the entire transaction fails, we probably need to remember what was done, right? So we need to keep track of what we've been doing or what we've been done or what the database was like beforehand and uh, ensure that we return to that state or rather uh, we never go to the new state if we don't fully complete. Okay, so one way that we may be able to do this is by making kind of a temporary copy of our database, changing the things we want to change, and then once we've completed all of our changes, once we've updated all the things we want to update, uh, actually just basically change a pointer from you know our old database to our new database. And so immediately you know have a single atomic operation that swaps the two. And of course that operation has to be atomic too but that one should be pretty easy to make atomic since it's, uh, we'll say, a much smaller task. The next property that we'll discuss is consistency. And so consistency is the guarantee that any of the operations that you're going to perform are not going to invalidate the constraints of a database. This does not mean that the operations that you're going to perform are going to do what you think they're going to do. They'll do whatever they're written to do. Um, but what this will do is ensure that even if you write your operation in a way that you didn't mean to, that it's not going to break things. And so an example of breaking things, uh, from a database perspective at least, is that a feature can only be one data type. And so if you attempt to run an instruction, if you attempt to run an update that sets a data type that is maybe integers to something that is a string, you, it, it will not run. And it will atomically not run, so nothing will be changed at all, right? And so this is an important detail. Uh, next, we'll talk about isolation. 10 minutes. Isolation is another property. And what we can think about is, you know, generally speaking, and, you know, this is, uh, I'll say, very, very good practice if you want an efficient uh, data database, is transactions need to be implemented so that they can run concurrently. And what that means is, you know, one person needs to be making a change over here, and you can be making a change over here. And even if these maybe are touching the same data, they're going to pretend like they are done sequentially. 
And so the example we'll give is we'll say two people are trying to give discounts at the same time. Both of them try to update sales where, you know, order total is order total minus one or order total is order total times 0.95. Well, you know, this is definitely going to cause some some troubles because what if you minus one and then times 0.95 on some data versus 0.95 and then minus one on other data? Well, you know, you're going to get two totally different results there, right? And, you know, um, they might occur at different times on different data. Maybe this person is trying to discount, uh, you know, some data. and This person is trying to discount a different set of data. They could reach, you know, different data points at different times, basically as well as the fact that you know they can just be running on different computers and you really aren't guaranteed that uh, these things will happen when you think they're going to happen. So the property of isolation is going to ensure that our concurrent transactions are going to leave our database in the same state as if they were performed sequentially. And so this goes into the same you know idea of things failing with atomicity, but really the important thing that I want you to remember is that it's going to say, okay, whichever one of these I got first, I will ensure that whatever it does happens first, and then whatever the second one does happens second. Now, there's, again, a couple ways to do this. One of the easier ways to implement is a thing called locking, which you discuss in CS241, I believe. Maybe 233, I can't remember which one's which. In either case, uh, locking is basically saying, hey, while I'm touching this data, nobody else can touch it until I'm done touching it. And so, you know, this person goes and edits their data and then they release the lock. And this person picks up the lock and, and touches the, uh, adjusts the data then. The other option to do it is a little bit more complex and it involves, uh, you know, kind of a, a GitHub way of thinking, which is with commits saying, you know, this is the data that I've adjusted. What data have you adjusted? Um, you know, it, is this the same order? If it isn't, we need to go back and fix things. And then the final one that we're going to talk about is durability. And so durability is basically, by, I would say, by far the easiest to understand, which is uh, once you have completed a transaction, it remains completed. That's pretty much it. Um, you know, if, if you complete some transaction and then your computer shuts off, as long as you've gotten to the point where the transaction is completed, hence the atomicity, it will remain completed. Uh, so no non-transactional event will undo that transaction. And the reason why we say non-transactional here is because obviously you can undo the query by you know, finding some query that turns it back into the state that it was before, right? So for these, we can say update sales set order total, order total minus one, and then immediately after run, you know, order total plus one, and it will be quote unquote undone. But, you know, uh, we, we still kind of treat that as two things that have been completed and been durably completed. Okay, so that's really most of the content for today's lecture. Um, it was a little bit shorter, um, but that's because I think the topic of databases is a little bit shorter. It doesn't totally fit into two lectures, and it doesn't uh, totally fit into one, or it definitely doesn't fit into one. And so I'm actually glad that we have a little bit of extra time here because I wanted to mention something briefly about uh, actually backend that we maybe didn't talk so much about beforehand. And so some people mentioned that... Um, using handlebars and using kind of the syntax of blocks and templates is a little bit, we'll say cumbersome. And they were wondering about any, you know, alternatives that are a little bit easier to understand. And what I'll say is there's many, many, many different t templating languages. And one of the most popular is Pug. Uh, this is the one that I use personally. And so uh, I I'm not going to, you know, we have five minutes left, and so I'm by no means going to go into this in great detail, but I, I do want to look at some basic examples on how they do it. And so what they do is they have these blocks, which are a little bit reminiscent of the blocks that we were using, but the difference is these are really basically just saying put everything in here uh, where you want it. And so you can define a block like this. And of course, you can, again, basically run Python in these, maybe a little bit more closer to Python with each pet name in pets versus like four pet name in pets. And then we have these include statements, which I think are really kind of magical. And for include pet.pug, you know, um, we're basically uh, including like some other whole set of code that we can just kind of like plop there and, and everything goes well. 
Additionally, you know, it maybe is a little bit cleaner. It cares about white space, which is how it does the indentation. And so you don't have to worry about, you know, cumbersome angle brackets. And then, you know, this is saying, uh, I want a div with the class sidebar, a div with the class primary. It is sometimes a little bit weird to just look at for the first time and understand, but um, it, it is kind of a nice combination of Python and HTML, in my opinion. Uh, and so for those of you who are interested in kind of going more into, I guess this would be full stack, right? The combination between front end and back end, um, some templating language like Pug or one of the many uh, other ones, you know, I'm not saying Pug is the best. Uh, it's probably worth it to read or to learn about, right? I'm trying to see if we can easily get just a uh, basic example, but I'm not sure it's uh, so clearly found anywhere, if I'm being honest. And maybe we can see some examples here. So yeah, you can see, you know, it's pretty straightforward how it works. Um, you know, maybe not clear at first, but you know, once you start to read it a little bit, we can say, oh, you know, I want a div with these certain parameters. You just put it in parentheses. I want something to have a certain class. You can just put it after the dot. Made it, you know, just like this, or like that for that matter. Same thing with IDs. Anyway, I did just want to introduce that since there were some questions about it. Uh, but yeah, it, it's, you know, maybe some extra content by all means. Um, but, you know, we're an honors class. And so that's what we're about is learning about cool things. Um, on Thursday, we'll talk about uh, object-oriented databases, which are, I will say, a little bit more popular nowadays, um, definitely newer. And then we'll also talk about graphical databases, which uh, probably are objectively less popular than either relational or object-oriented, but uh, in my opinion are super cool. And so we'll talk about those for a little bit. Uh, additionally, we'll talk about some more properties of like building kind of good and smart databases, and it'll get maybe a little bit more uh, interesting to those of you who are interested in building good or smart databases and, and laying out your databases in ways that are objectively good and kind of quantifiably good. Uh, and those of you who aren't, you'll be learning something new and interesting. And so, you know, uh, maybe you'll have a great time regardless. In either case, we'll end lecture. It uh, looks like one or so minutes early. Uh, I hope you all have a wonderful uh, single break day. Um, do do try to relax a little bit. I know it is only one day, but um, do attempt, you know, go outside, go on a walk, uh, go to the quad, hang out there, take a nap, something like that, right? Um, Self-care is, is very important and uh, prioritize it. But all, in any case, I'll see you all on Thursday. Bye-bye. Uh, and uh, also, don't forget that homework is being released on Thursday instead of Tuesday. So don't worry too much about that. Uh, see ya.